A sea of orange t-shirts. Honk if you've seen a bear. Where's the pasta? Goats, chickens, and dogs, oh my. Friendship bracelets. Love your neighbor as yourself. Showers in the rain. Hammering, shoveling, sawing, insulating, sheet rocking, folding, cleaning. Kitchen crew dance parties. Riddles in the car to pass the time. Don't judge a book by its cover. Group yoga and prayer to get the day started. Devotions and reflection to end the day the right way. That seems to have worked, and that seems what we ought to do. Respond to people. This may seem like just a random assortment of sayings or wacky words to all of you who are here this morning. But to me, they are vivid reminders of a week away in Orland, Maine, serving with an amazing group of youth and adults at Homeworkers Organized for More Employment or Home. I actually chose the scripture reading for today a week before we went to pick up rental cars, packed them up with clothes, food, first aid kits, the essential bag of blow pops, and an enthusiastic mission team, and hit the road. Little did I know how much it would make sense, right? How much the short five verses from Acts would speak to the situation of a small cooperative community in Maine <laughs> that taught us throughout the week many life lessons. You'll get to hear from our mission team about their experiences a little bit later in the fall. So today you have to deal with the pastor's perspective on what took place during a week at home. Consider this a brief preview of the best that is yet to come when you hear it from the mouths of babes, as they, stay, as they say, from the perspective of our youth who you would have been so proud of, watching them work and live and serve with one another. So five important tidbits of life lesson that all added up to one grand lesson in community. Lesson number one, resourcefulness. There's nothing like getting home from a hot and messy day of work, right? I happen to be painting on this particular day and hearing the words, we're not gonna shower today, <laughs> right? We were living in close quarters. You never really wanna hear those words from a group of teenagers. <laughs> <clears throat> but these words were spoken out of the mouths of two of our teenage girls as we pulled into the parking lot at the end of a day of work. <clears throat> Home is situated on a previously dirt road right off of Route 1 as you come through Bucksport into Orland and then on to Ellsworth, Maine. The volunteer center where the female team members slept also housed the marketplace, a small store and also a place where community members came for a good cup of coffee and some home-baked goods in the morning. It also housed the two kitchens we used to prepare meals and had a water supply, not town or public water, that was connected to the shower house. Well, we came to realize about Tuesday that there was not always really great water supply or water pressure, especially when you're trying to shower 33 volunteers at the end of a day. So come Wednesday, after we had a bout with toilet issues, always fun, minimal water to clean dishes, and so on and so forth, we came to realize that water is really not something to take for granted, right? So no showers meant that we would have water for other community and group needs later in the day and for the other days in the week. Baby wipes sufficed, got the job done that we needed to get done, and the lesson continued on later as it rained and you could see a group of girls out in the parking area with their shampoo bottles in hand, right? <laughs> Using those other natural resources to get the job done instead. Resourcefulness became a key theme for the week as we saw a run to the lo local grocery store take place each morning to gather the items that were being removed from the shelf that, although still usable, were going to be thrown away. That food was used each day to feed the 50 plus volunteers who live and serve at home, as well as to give out to the members of the greater Orland community to help su supplement their own household budgets and resources. Our group chose to use reusable dishes each day for meals instead of paper, knowing that in doing so, we would be allowing a better situation for our environment, and we were also in good company with all of the folks at home who ate there each and every day. 
So lesson number one, resourcefulness. Lesson number two, accountability. It all began for us on Monday morning when we gathered in our circle to have morning prayer and we were each assigned a number, one through 33. That number was how we made sure we had everyone in place for all of our group activities. Each of us became accountable not only for ourselves but for the people to the right and the left of us. For me, Mike Murphy, number two on one side and Wyatt Hathaway, number 33 on the other. If they were not there to call their number, we had to know who was missing and help to solve the mystery of where they might be lurking about. <laughs> we were accountable for each other, making sure that we were all together, that no one missed anything important. We were accountable for one another at work sites, making sure that we were working together well and safely so that no one would get injured. And we didn't make a trip to the hospital this time, so there you go. We were accountable to one another in the evenings as we carried out our group chores, cooking dinner, cleaning dishes, taking care of common areas, shopping for food, leading devotions. If we did not hold one another accountable for those things, we would have had a group of hungry volunteers with no clean anything and would not have been able to center ourselves as a group on what was most important, on what it was that we were there to do and who for, namely our God. And we watched as the folks who worked at home held one another accountable for their assigned responsibilities as well, as they carried them out and stepped in when someone was sick and unable to accomplish their tasks for the day, as they even had conflict about what and how things were to happen, but managed to work it out one with another. So that leads us to lesson number three, healthy conflict. Not two words that we generally hear in a sentence together. We had a chance to sit down with Sister Lucy, a former nun who began home in 1971 out of a desire to help people in the community make ends meet by providing them a place to sell their handcrafted goods. This is a woman who has built an organization that has been studied by folks who determine the likelihood of success of nonprofits throughout the country. And she has been told that no one understands how they do it. If they were run like any other nonprofit, they would need a budget of millions of dollars and lots of people on the ground who do nothing but development and management. But instead, home relies on the grace of God, a few annual fundraisers, and supporters from the groups who come to work there in order to make ends meet. And although Lucy is the president, and therefore the buck does officially stop with her, she relies on the help and guidance of others working cooperatively to make home work. Since its beginning in 1971, it's expanded to include craft centers, a food pantry, various shelters and respectable low-income housing, a saw and shingle mill, and so much more. So when we asked Lucy the question about what was the hardest thing she faces in running home, we expected her to say that it was something like the funding or about gaining support from the local community. But that wasn't it. She said that the most difficult and most painful thing they face as a community is conflict. When brothers and sisters who quite literally dwell together do not dwell together in unity. When something in their relationship system has broken down and they are working from a place of resentment or anger, ego or pain instead of from a place of love from their neighbor, for their neighbor and wanting what's best for their community. She said that when these things happen, it's most important to treat the issues early so that they can get back to doing what they have been called to do, which is to serve God and one another. As I looked around the room at this group of 26 teenagers and adults who I know are at times in conflict either with one another or others in their families and communities, all I could think was what an amazing thing it would be if we could all take Sister Lucy's lesson to heart to deal with conflict as it arises in the way the Bible tells us, right? Directly with the person who is offended or along with an advocate if necessary. But honestly, directly and quickly, so we can be about the business of serving God, our community, and our world. So lesson number four, trust and do not judge. The folks who serve at home on a day-to-day -day basis are people who all have stories, and don't we all too? They're people who serve and live there because they want to and have felt called to do so. 
They are people who serve and live there because they've been released from jail and had nowhere else to go. They're people who serve and live there because they couldn't find a job and needed a place to live and wanted to be able to give something back in return. They are above all wonderful, loving, patient, and hopeful people who seek to serve God and serve their community, those who are in need, those to whom we are all called to respond to. We learned some of their stories throughout the week. Our group took time to ask questions, to build trust, to sing with them, <laughs> to allow space to open up to others so that they would in turn open up to us. And we realized once again that you can't judge a book by its cover. You have no idea what someone's story is until you allow them the space to tell it. And the greatest compliments our kids received throughout the, the week was that there were people at home who were willing to share their stories with them to share with them about their lives, their hopes, their dreams. We were in a community where we could trust people and didn't take that trust and that sharing for granted. <clears throat> so finally, lesson number five. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, coming from a Christian community, we wouldn't think that we would need to be taught this lesson. And perhaps we weren't taught it as much as we were reminded of it once again, but from a different perspective this time. It's unfortunately easy to forget, I fear, this lesson and the ins and outs of our daily life. But these are the words on which Sister Lucy hangs her hat, so to speak, and therefore on which home operates first and foremost. We are all the same, said Lucy. Deep down, we are God's children, and we need to love one another in that way. This is often easier said than done, but we saw firsthand what it meant to the community at home that they really do live this way that they love one another and treat one another as they wish to be treated, that they see everyone, no matter what their position, as brothers and sisters in a common goal, which they are able to offer, which means that they are able to offer extravagant welcome to others. And through that extravagant welcome, they're able to turn lives around, to encourage one another, to land in a better place. So what does all of this have to do with today's scripture, my friends? The truth is that home, unlike most communities, really does function much like that early Christian community that Carol read about in the book of Acts, right? They do hold all things in common. They live together in houses and shelters and volunteer centers. They share meals together. They work together to build one another up and to build up the body of Christ in that small piece of God's kingdom in Orland, Maine. Now, I can't say that I think that our entire world would be able to function this way. I fear that we've strayed too far from one another. There's too much difference in the way that we run economies and allocate resources and hold one another accountable for things. But I do believe that we could do a much better job than we're doing right now. There is no reason why a grocery store, or my family for that matter, should be throwing away food because it goes bad, when there are millions of people in this world who every night go to bed hungry, who die of malnutrition and starvation. There is no reason why cutting one another up and criticizing one another or speaking unkind words to or about one another, even in jest, needs to be the way of this world, even though oftentimes it is. When we have every opportunity to resolve conflicts as they arise and to build one another up, to care about and to encourage one another. Now, the most difficult part of this change in living, perhaps, is taking the first step. As a community, we work to take the first step when we use and share our resources wisely, we work to take the first step when we do hold one another accountable and work with each other to build up trust and encourage. We work to take the first step when we learn about situations in our own community, in our country, and in our world that shouldn't be with the overabundance of resources that we have. So today, my prayer is that God may bless our taking of those first steps, right? that God may bless us and help us in our stewardship of our resources, because that's really what this scripture reading is about. That's really what the lessons that we learned at home are all about, is our stewardship. 
My prayer this day is that God may bless us and help us in our ability to love and serve our neighbor as we strive to share a common spirit and purpose. And my prayer today is that God may bless us and help us as we work to build and live and trust and love in community with one another this day and in the future. Amen.